Hello, I'm Zippy Duval. I'm president of American Farm Bureau and host of the Farmside Chat. Welcome back. And all of you know that I travel the country and get to talk to farmers and ranchers, doing all kinds of things that helps fill the pantries of Americans and a lot of pantries across the rest of the world. But this week, uh, we're going to talk about someone that has experience in two different kinds of fields. One, field of growing crops but also the football field, because we're knee deep in football season. And I know everybody's enjoying Friday night football with their high school, favorite high school team. And also Saturday, uh, seeing our college players play and some of you like uh, pro football and, and spend it into Sunday, watch them. But this farmer is gonna be fun to talk to. His, Matt, his name is Matt Kroll. He's from Iowa. He played football at the uh, at Iowa for the uh, the Hawkeyes, and then went on to play uh, uh, at the New York Jets. So welcome, Matt. We've been looking forward to having this conversation with you, but I'd like for you to start out by telling us a little bit about your experience on the field with the Iowa Hawkeyes and at the New York Jets. Yeah, so... Uh... I started playing about 2005, graduated high school in 2004, and then from 05 to 08, uh, played defensive tackle for the University of Iowa. Um, like I mentioned, it, it's uh, about 20 minutes from my farm, so it's kind of a natural fit for me to go play for the Hawks. And then uh, after college, from uh, 2009, 2012, I played uh, for the New York Jets, so part of their active squad, part of their practice squad. Um, so it was kind of a cool experience to be out East and to be in New Jersey and New York and, and experience that culture. You know, quite a different change in culture from the farm to New York City. <laughs> little, little, uh, little different pace, Mr. Duvall. Yeah, that's uh, still good people, but a different uh, pace of life for sure. You know, when I think of New York Jazz, I think of Joe Ma uh, Namath and, uh, you know, uh, when I was a kid, he was a hero to everybody, you know, and uh, so New York he was Jets still around. And he, yeah. was, he was still around a lot of practices. So Broadway Joe was uh, there quite a bit. So really? Yeah. It's so, interesting you got, his... you... so you got to meet him, man. Yeah, no, he uh, he talked about every camp. You know, I was in four camps, so he was around the team quite a bit. And he's I don't think he's changed much since, uh, since he played. He's still a pretty uh, big personality. I'm surprised as bad as his knees was, he could even walk around after all those years. Know. <laughs> yeah, that was some the wonderful childhood memories of watching him. He was pretty, pretty neat to watch. So there's a lot of lessons to be learned on the field, in the field, whether it be on a football field or whether it be out in the field growing a crop. Tell us some of the lessons that you learned it on the football field that you carried over into agriculture. Sure. I mean, it's it's kind of cliche to say, but you get out of things what you put into them. And that's, uh, you know, that's directly correlation between farming and football. I mean, football, you got lifting weights, you got film, you got studying your opponent. Um, you got the whole winter program, summer program, getting ready for fall. And then uh, when it's time to execute and whether that's be on the field or in the field, um, planting crop or taking care of that crop, you know, it just comes with preparing and uh, being consistent was my biggest thing. Um, with the Hawks, I, I started 50 straight games. Um, so that's kind of what I carried into farming. It was just day-to-day -day basis, um, grinding and, and working and putting the time in to, to make the crops work and, and, uh, fight the battle against mother nature when she rears her head and, and do the best you can with what you can control. So it sounds like persistence and determination and, you know that 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 it, that uh, describes farm farming. That's for sure. I think it represents yeah a majority of the farmers. You know, definitely. I guess uh, you know things are going to go your way, and you uh, adapt, overcome, and and uh, hopefully succeed at the end of the year. Yeah, you know, and I'm sure that you know we watch y'all you know, play on Saturday, on Sunday, and uh, nobody really thinks about the time and effort you put into it before you get there. And and I'm sure when somebody's chowing down on a good hamburger or eating some beautiful for vegetables they don't really think about all the toll that goes into the to the work of growing that crop either so it, there are a lot of similarities to it sure yeah and i probably didn't think about that too mr duvall when i was uh shoving food in my face trying to weigh 315 <laughs> pounds and uh play d line and o line for the jets and you know things that we take for granted when you know i was just playing a game for a living 
you know, one of those deals and all the food you could eat in college too. And, you know, you, you, a lot of people do it and even, even farmers do at times, you know, there's all types of farmers. And sometimes we take for granted of, you know, how blessed we are to, to grow the food that people eat. So uh, th that's good lead into my next question. When you were playing ball, whether it be college or pro, uh, how many of those guys had any interest in that food and knowing that you came from a farm? Were there many questions about it? Um, they were, I mean, there were some stereotypical, uh, Hey Matt, where are you from? Yeah. From Iowa. They're like, Oh, you a farmer? I'm like, well, yeah, I, I came from a farm. Yeah. And they just, you know, that was, uh, that was Mark Sanchez. So he was a Cali boy. He was our first round draft pick for the jets that year that I came to them, you know, and he didn't, he didn't mean anything by it. You know, he was just, uh, kind of going off what he knew or learned of Midwesterners. So, um, yeah, you got some, you got some, uh, glimpses or gave them some glimpses into into your upbringing and you know that was the beauty of of sharing a locker room too was uh the amount of different backgrounds and, and culture that was in a locker room of, of 53 guys in in pro and then 120 guys in in college that came from all different backgrounds all different areas of the of the state so um yeah it was interesting and and some guys latched on and I brought some guys out here and experienced uh showed them what a diversified farm in, in eastern Iowa would look like yeah yeah it's uh, it's amazing how people really are interested in where their food comes from making a difference how old they are or, or where they're from they're always interested in that so is there a moment in foot your football career that you feel really defined who you are I think I kind of mentioned it um you know I was blessed not to get injured and not to get hurt and be productive enough on the field that I could start 50 straight games. So I started every, uh, every game that was available to play uh, for four years. So came in as I redshirted and then freshman through senior year played every game um, at D tackle. So I think that, you know, hopefully that's testament to like we talked about, just uh, put in the work and, and showing up every day and, and uh, being on time, going to class and, and uh, producing on Saturdays. So if one thing that, you know, exemplified my career was just consistency and, and hard work. You know, and I would think a lot of uh, young men that play at that level, both of those levels, had that same uh, hard work. But I, I would think coming from the farm, it probably came more natural to you than it did to most. I, I remember my son was in the military and he was flying uh, Blackhawks over in Iraq. His superior wrote me and said, man, if I had a whole – group of farm boys like your son said we could get in and out of here right quick you know it, it was pretty amazing he recognized that about him yeah yeah and yeah you I always thought in camp you know you got your football helmet on you got 20 25 pounds of gear but there's really nothing harder than bale and straw or square bale and hay when it's 110 degrees with 100 you know percent humidity so you know those times where you're working or working cattle or doing whatever you do on your place you know you when you're playing football you're just playing a game and there's really nothing harder than than working on the farm some days that's right you know i i wished i was as young as you are i even though it was hard work it, it you know i look back at it, it was some of the best times of my life you know when yeah. i could when i could get out there and hang with the best of them and i can still hang with you for about 10 minutes <laughs> <laughs> that's what I people ask hey can you still play i'm like no i can give you three seconds of one play probably and i'll still feel it tomorrow but you know it's a yeah. different world did you grow up in uh georgia then mr duvall i did i okay, did i you. grew up grew up here in georgia on the dairy farm gotcha gotcha and, and and not many people know this but i walked on to try to play football at first presbyterian and i made it for four hours in try out that, that was about all perfect you gave it a go <laughs> you gave it a go Oh, it was fun. The coach said if he was handing out scholarships for guts, I'd be first in line. So <laughs> hey, I'll take that. I'll take that. Yeah, it, it was a great experience. So, and you know, there's something pretty neat about the Hawkeyes and and, it, and it's about America needs farmers. Tell us a little bit about that program, how it got started and your involvement in it. Yeah, so it was uh, it was actually quite uh, coincidental just the timing of it all um coach fry the coach coach hayden fry the coach before uh, coach ference that currently is there and was there when i played um introduced it during the farm crisis of the mid 80s so they made that decision um i don't know if it was beginning of season or right before the rose bowl where they're playing um decided to put that on their on their helmet and then uh 
we in about 2006 or seven, what kind of the midst of my career at Iowa, um, Coach Ferentz decided to bring it back. So um, he told the story and kind of gave the history because at that point, you know, I was born in 1986. So, you know, I was just at the tail end of that crisis, but obviously didn't know what ANF meant or how, what the history of ANF was um, and what it meant to University of Iowa and to Iowa farmers and to farmers, you know, in this nation. So um, coach brought it back, kind of told the story um, in 2007, I believe. Um, and right now it still sits on the back of our helmets for, uh, for every game as the Hawkeyes. So, you know, it's just a symbol to kind of, like we discussed, a symbol to, you know, get people to realize, you know, America needs farmers and we need them for a lot of things. And that's far, that's uh, fuel, food, fiber, you know, whatever, whatever you want to say, you know, we kind of are woven into every, uh, every person's daily life. Yeah, really, truly, it means national security to us too, because we can feed our own people. We don't have to True. depend on somebody else. And, and I think that's uh, a, a wonderful thing that uh, college football uh, uh, organization recognizes uh, how important this industry is is to everyone, you know, I, you know, for those of you listening, they started programming in the mid eighties. I, I was farming as a very young farmer during the mid eighties in a dairy business. And, and I remember, you know, we didn't have TV 24 hours a day like we do now, but every night when you go in and listen to the news, some farmer was going through a terrible time somewhere in the country because of the economy that we were in during the end, we was paying anywhere from 15 to 20 percent interest uh, a lot of our farmers were uh, their loans were upside down because all of a sudden their farmland went to zero uh lesser value and and they were upside down on the loans and a lot of a lot of farmers uh hurt themselves during that time because it was just a very difficult time and the mental stress was terrible uh yeah. so I, I can see uh why uh coach fry started that program and it makes a lot of sense to me because I lived through that very difficult time and, and yeah. didn't know whether I would make it. I almost lost my place three times here uh, and was able to get through it. But because of a lot of hard work, but a lot of uh, dedicated people to the industry in my community that helped you get through. And I'm sure that was felt in Iowa and all over this country. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, uh, that program still on the helmets today, right? Yep, you got it. Yeah, when Coach brought it back uh, mid two thousands, and it's still on the still on the still on the helmets. And then every game, um, we honor a new, I guess, ex um, hawk. That ex example, you know, hard work, integrity. You know, I I should know all the all the evaluation status for that, but um, because I was a two thousand nineteen honoree for that uh, ANF Wall of Fame, we call it. So. Um, every year there's a new honoree um, and kind of that's the ANF game. I think it's uh, late October this year. Um, and Brian Bulaga, I believe, is this year's recipient. And he was an old lineman when I was in school. Um, but I think there are 12, 13 guys now that are on that wall of fame. So, wow. yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome that that program still recognizes the, the importance of farmers. So let's let's go back and talk about your farm a little bit. Tell us a little bit about the history and tell us how you made the, the transition from the New York Jets back to your, your family farm. Yeah, so uh, I came back in 2012. So I call it a early forced retirement from the New York Jets. So someone's always coming, coming to take your spot, bigger, faster, stronger. So I came back in 2012 um, and been farming full time uh, for 11 years now, I guess. And um, kind of that's the recent history. And then before that, uh, my dad is still full time on the place. Um, he bought the farm during that crisis. You know, like you mentioned, borrowed money at nineteen percent. You know, bought the farm. Uh, my mom and dad, John and Kayleen, um, and that's that kind of spurred our diversification of what we do. So, our home farm we ran our own about twelve hundred acres, um, but it's pretty diversified. In you know, springtime we have five greenhouses um, dedicated to the annuals, perennials, vegetable starts. Um, in the summer, we sell produce, and then we started a CSA program, Community Support Agriculture Program, that we've done for 10 years, kind of since I've been back, um, developed that program, and, and that's a good program for us for the summer months. Um, our biggest attraction um, is pumpkins, so we that's where we draw the most crowd, um, and I guess as far as 
you know, profits on farm that makes up a pretty large chunk of what we do these uh, months of September and October. Um, we sell firewood year round because amongst that 1200 acres, there's about five, 600 acres of row crop and hay ground. And then the other half is timber and pasture. So we run 150 head of beef cows um, as well. And then uh, we sell firewood bulk and we sell firewood in the uh, firewood bundles that you see at, you know, area grocery stores, convenience stores. We do those as well. So that's kind of a life cycle. What we do, uh, Mr. Duvall, and then I sell for Bex hybrids as well. Um, you know, that's a year round job selling seed and, uh, you know, representing farmers in my area. Um, so that's kind of that diversification spurred their early nineties. Um, first we started growing some tomatoes and grew some sweet corn. Um, and now we grow every vegetable A to Z. We grow about 15 acres of sweet corn. And then we grow about 45 acres this year of pumpkins, which range from, you know, the jumbos to regulars, to specialty pumpkins, to minis, to gourds. Uh, winter squash, et cetera. Um, before that farm crisis, you know, we were Grandpa Howard and Elizabeth Wolf. Um, they, you know, were typical farm, you know, had some open feral hogs, ran some beef cows, did some corn and soybean farming. Um, and that was, uh, that was mid 1950s. So it's been in the cruel name since the mid 1950s when those two got married. And then the previous 90 to hundred years, it was in the wolf name. So it's been in the family since the mid 1860s. Um, it just transferred to the Kroll name when Howard married Elizabeth Wolf, um, in 1954, I believe if my history is correct. So, um, yeah, it's been, uh, however you want to lay it 160 years, Wolf Kroll family. So, um, and we, my wife and I, Nicole, have had the opportunity to expand a little more and buy a few more acres. So, um, it's been a, yeah, it's been good. And, uh, I've got John and Kayleen, like I mentioned, my, my, uh, mom and dad, and then my brother is also full-time here. Got an older brother of eight years. Um, he handles a lot of the combining and row crop spraying, you know, tillage and things like that. And then I handle all the planting in the spring. So, um, yeah, team effort. And, uh, you know, it's always been pretty uh, heavily, uh, you know, ran and operated by, by the family. So I'm going to dip down a little bit more into your community support agriculture business. Uh, they call it CFAs. I see that all over the country. A lot, a lot of people that's listening may not know what a CSA is. So uh, tell us a little bit more about that program and tell us what kind of inspired you to do that. Yeah. So uh, that that model, I guess, has been around for almost probably 30 years, Mr. Duvall. So um, basically the premise is the premise uh, about midwinter, you'll have CSA shareholders, we call them, that'll purchase their share up front. So the whole idea behind community sport agriculture was for the consumer to kind of share in the risk, you know, sharing and buying that seed, buying fertilizer, you know, whatever you need to get that crop going um, in those winter months. And then our starts in June. So it goes from the first week of June to the end of September. Um, and every week we, um, we deliver door to door. Other CSAs are set up different. Some come on farm and, and grab the share. Um, but every week our consumers or families get a full uh, bushel box of vegetables, whatever's in season. Um, so it gives them a chance to not only get fresh produce picked within, you know, picked within 20 miles of them, picked within 24 hours, um, delivered to their doorstep. Um, you know, that goes for us for 16 weeks. A lot of CSAs have spring, summer, fall shares. We just have a summer share. Um, but yeah, we deliver those vegetables and it gives that those people a chance to kind of see uh you know, how a season progresses and what's available in Iowa um, during those different weeks of the of the CSA program. Yeah, uh, those programs are usually successful and the people that participate in them usually are very, very happy to get those fresh, fresh vegetables all during that time. So uh, I know that we're uh, in the fall season. I know that your busy time with pumpkins are is coming up. Tell us what that looks like. I mean, in your community, are you sending them off to bid a Walmart? Are they buying them on your farm? How do, what's that look like? Yeah, we do both. We sit right on a pretty major highway, Highway 1. Um, like I said, it's about 15 minutes from Iowa City. It's about 15 minutes from Cedar Rapids, which are two, you know, one of two of the top five, you know, biggest, you know, cities in Iowa. So really blessed to be that close. Um to those communities, you know, they support us really well. So 
that used to be we just sell everything retail. Um, we have a farm store right on the place. Um, then when I came back, I kind of tried to up it, you know, obviously make a little room for myself uh, in this place. So we started wholesaling to area high V's, which is a pretty major uh, grocery chain in the Midwest. Um, and then we do some fairways and other convenience stores and things, um, shipping them wholesale. So I would say now, um, as far as profit goes, we're about 50, 50 when it comes to wholesale to retail. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, we've been picking since counting the days, August 28th, I think we've been picking pumpkins. So turn Labor Day, um, those stores want their fall displays up, which is, uh, which is fine with us. The sooner we can get picking and, and get selling, you know, we're happy to do it. So yeah, every day's uh picking something and we ship pretty heavy on Tuesday, Thursday, Fridays, as far as to those wholesale partners. And then we're open seven days a week um, for the fall season. So uh, when do you have to start a pumpkin plant to be able to pick in late August? In our, in our climate, um, we shoot for June 1st, about June 14th you know, weather okay. dependent. So what's the biggest, what's the biggest challenge you face in, in a growing a pumpkin? Oh, weed control for us. Um, we've done some different things with cover crops. You know, we're a pretty big believer in cover crops, um, not only from a weed suppression standpoint, but uh, um, cattle grazing as well. Um, we utilize that to our advantage, you know, early spring, late fall, grazing some of that ryegrass that we put down for a cover crop. But um, you know, like anything, we were really dry this year, total during grow growing season. We probably had about three and a half, you know, three and three quarter inches of rain, which is, uh, you know, 20% of, of average. So, uh, but they surprised, they surprised us. The sweet corn all did well. Um, the pumpkins did well, but it's just like any farmer, mother nature is, you know, our, uh, our biggest threat or our biggest enemy, I guess at times. So, or the best thing that happens to us when, uh, when it's a timely rain and when we need it. So, but we, we, weed suppression and pumpkins and then, um, you know, just overall moisture. Yeah. So, uh, the, the, uh, you mentioned cover crop. We talked a lot about cover crop and some other practices be sustainable and that's good for the climate. Any, any other sustainable practices that you'd like to talk about? We do, uh, you know, we're, we sit right next to Cedar river. So it's pretty major your river in Iowa too. So we have a lot of, uh, you know, repairing buffers along those, you know, utilizing the conservation programs um, in that regard. Um, and then, yeah, we, we try and cover crop pretty much every acre that's close to that um, watershed, I guess, you know, just to, you know, when flooding does happen, which a lot of years it does, this is the probably only the third time in my 11 years that it hasn't gone underwater. Um, our bottom tier of fields, I guess you could say. So, you know, sooner I get that cover crop on, there's something on that ground to, you know, hold it in place. And so we don't lose that topsoil when weather happens or a weather event happens of flooding, um, you know, doing all we can to try and preserve that. So uh, college football, pro football, which one you enjoy the most? I played a lot more. <laughs> I played a lot more in the college football, but, uh, you know, like I'm sure every guy would say college football is just so wholesome and, and, you know, the fan base of college, you know, especially in this state of Iowa, you know, it's, it's pretty much our pro team. So, um, you know, college football and, and NFL football are, are different animals, but, uh, you know, I definitely enjoyed college, but at the same time, you know, to play with the best in the world um, in the NFL was a, was a pretty, pretty amazing time to play with guys like LaDainian Tomlinson and, and Jason Taylor was there when I was at the Jets, you know, play with some of those guys that I, you know, idolized when I was playing junior high and high school, and then to finally play with them at the tail end of their career, you know, it's pretty special, special thing. I enjoyed both, but probably uh, college football would, would edge it out. You want to make any predictions on the college football? <laughs> I don't. I need <laughs> to get, I keep telling my wife, it's kind of a buck list. I need to get down south and watch one of those, you know, experience a game day of a, of a Southern, you know, college football Saturday, but you, you come to my farm. I'm about 30 minutes from the University of Georgia right now. Oh, yeah. Right now, that's the thing to watch for the last couple of years. Well, they so, have been. Yeah, you, sure you, have. You, you. I, I, I'll put you up. You get out here. We'll find you a ticket somewhere. So. All right. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> no predictions. Well, we sure have enjoyed having our conversation. Anything else 
we haven't talked about you'd like to talk about your farm or football? Um, you know, I it's just uh, I'm glad you're doing things like this, Mr. Duvall, you know, to kind of, you know, be transparent and be open book. And that's kind of what we've always tried to do here. Um, about every day of October, we have school tours. So first through fourth graders, 40, 50 students a day will come through here and, you know, to keep that connection, you know, I think more and more, especially you understand, um, you hear it a lot. Oh, when I grew up on a farm or when I go visit my grandparents' farm, you know, there, every generation there seems to be a little larger disconnect. Um, so it's our job as farmers or, or organizations like you guys to keep people connected and keep them informed and to, you know, filter through some of that from that news that, you know, sometimes isn't the best when it comes to agriculture, but it's our job to put our best foot forward and educate the public on, um, you know, who we are and what we do and, and what we stand for. So if that's anything, you know, it's, it's the keep doing what we do and try and do it the right way, but keep people, keep the general public informed in what we do on a daily basis. Well, thank you so much, uh, Matt, for what you're do, doing on your farm there and, and trying to inform people as to what's going on in agriculture. We encourage all of you listening that, we're in the fall of the year and everybody's harvesting and there's probably a farm close to you that opens their gates up and allows you to come in and experience a little bit. And I promise you, if you uh, go and spend a little time with those farmers, you'll walk away with a great appreciation of this great industry we know as agriculture. Uh, so we encourage you to do that and enjoy the wonderful weather while you're out there. So today, uh, Matt Kroll, Kroll uh, has been with us and, uh, talked about a football field and his participation on the football program uh, and also in the field uh, growing his crops and we just surely appreciate you spending this time with us. Hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day and we say God bless you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Farmside Chat. Please be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And while you're at it, Take a minute to rate and review the podcast. This helps us continue to bring you farm fresh content that everyone can enjoy. Until next time, thank you and God bless you.